delight to be in Southampton this evening, to be back in the UK. Um, on Sunday, we went with Peter and Heather down to the docks, and there was the great Queen Elizabeth uh, moored. And it brought back memories, because when Jan and I first came to England to do my doctoral studies in philosophy at the University of Birmingham, the place that we arrived in England was Southampton, uh, aboard the QE2. And so it brought back all those memories of uh, being here in 1975 and the wonderful years that we spent in this country and how much we enjoy uh, coming back. And so I'm grateful that you've come this evening and that I've been given the opportunity to speak on this most important subject of the resurrection of Jesus. A few years ago, I was speaking on a major Canadian university campus on the evidence for the existence of God. And one slightly irate student wrote on her comment card, turned in afterwards, I was with you until you got to the stuff about Jesus. God is not the Christian God. Now this attitude is all too typical today. I find that most people are happy to agree that God exists, but it's become politically incorrect to claim that God has decisively revealed himself in Jesus. What justification can Christians offer as opposed to Muslims or Jews or Hindus or others for thinking that the Christian God is real? Well, the answer of the New Testament to that question is clear. The resurrection of Jesus. The apostles proclaimed, and I quote, God will judge the world by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. The resurrection is God's public vindication of Jesus' radical personal claims to be the absolute revelation of God. So, how do we know that Jesus is risen from the dead? There's an Easter hymn that says, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Now, I think that on a personal level, this answer is perfectly legitimate. But, when it comes to engaging in a conversation in the public square, or in letters to the editor, or in conversation with co-workers, then I think it's critical that Christians be able to present objective evidence in support of our beliefs. Otherwise, our claims hold no more credibility than the assertions of anyone else who claims to have a private religious experience. Fortunately, Christianity is peculiar in that it is a religion which is rooted in historical events. It makes claims which can therefore be investigated historically. Suppose then that this evening we agree to approach the documents of the New Testament not as inspired holy books, but rather simply as a collection of documents written in the Greek language, handed down out of the first century, telling this remarkable story about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, without any assumption whatsoever as to their reliability, of the same way we would approach other ancient documents for history. You might be surprised to learn that when ancient historians approach the New Testament documents with this attitude, that the majority of scholars today accept the central facts undergirding the inference to the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to emphasize that I'm not talking here about conservative scholars or evangelical scholars. Rather, I'm talking about the broad mainstream of critical, historical, New Testament scholarship today. The work that is done by professors who teach at secular universities and non-evangelical theological colleges. Amazing as it may seem, most of them have come to agree with the historicity of the central facts undergirding the resurrection of Jesus. 
And these are listed on your handout for your convenience. These facts are four in number. Fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in a tomb by a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea. Now this fact is important because it means, contrary to the claims of radical critics like John Dominic Crossan of the Jesus Seminar, that the location of Jesus' burial site was known in Jerusalem to both Jew and Christian alike. This fact is highly significant because the disciples could never have proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus in Jerusalem in the face of a tomb containing his corpse. New Testament scholars have established this fact on the basis of evidence such as the following four points which I shall highlight. Number one, Jesus' burial is attested in the very old tradition which is handed on by Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth, Greece. In chapter 15, verses 3 to 5, Paul writes as follows. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received. And then comes this four-line formula. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, it's the Aramaic word for Peter, and then to the twelve. Paul uses here not only the technical rabbinical terms for received and delivered with regard to the information that he's passing on to the Corinthians, but verses 3 to 5 are a highly stylized four-line formula which is replete with non-Pauline characteristics. This has convinced all scholars that Paul is, just as he says, quoting from an old tradition which he himself received and then in turn passed on to his converts in Corinth. This tradition probably goes back at least to Paul's fact-finding uh, journey to Jerusalem around AD 36 when he spent two weeks with Peter and with James in Jerusalem. Now, when you recall that Jesus was crucified around AD 30, that means that this information goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' crucifixion. So short a time span and such personal contact in this case make it idle to talk of legend with regard to the information in this formula. Secondly, the burial story of Jesus is part of a very old source used by Mark in writing his Gospel. When you read the Gospels, you find that they tend to consist of brief snapshots of Jesus' life and ministry, which are only loosely connected, rather like pearls on a string, and not always chronologically arranged. But when we come to the so-called passion story, the story of the final week of Jesus' suffering and death, then we do have one smooth, continuously running narrative. This suggests that the passion story was one of Mark's sources that he used in writing his gospel. Now most scholars already think that Mark is the earliest of the four gospels, and obviously his passion source must then be even earlier still, some of the earliest material in the New Testament. Comparison of the narratives of the four gospels with each other show that their accounts do not diverge from each other until after the burial story. They are in agreement right up through the burial account. This implies that the burial account is part of that pre-Markan passion source that Mark used in writing his gospel. So, we have here independent, early, attestation 
of the fact of Jesus' burial in this pre-mark and passion source in addition to the early information that is mediated by Paul in his tradition handed on to the Corinthians. Number three, as a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court that condemned Jesus to death, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to be a Christian invention. There was a very strong resentment in the early Christian church toward the Jewish leadership responsible for the condemnation of Jesus. They had, in effect, engineered a judicial murder of Jesus of Nazareth. And therefore, it's highly improbable that Christians would invent a member of the very court that condemned Jesus to death who would give him a proper burial instead of allowing his body to be disposed like a common criminal. And therefore, most scholars think we actually know the identity of the person who buried Jesus of Nazareth, namely Joseph from Arimathea. Fourth, no competing burial story exists. If the burial story about Joseph were fictitious, then we would expect to find either some other historical trace of what actually happened to Jesus' corpse, or at least some competing legends of what happened. But all of our sources are unanimous in ascribing to Joseph the honorable interment of Jesus in the tomb. For these and several other reasons, the vast majority of New Testament scholars today concur that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. According to the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. Fact number two, on the Sunday morning following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Among the reasons that have led most scholars to this conclusion are the following five points. Number one, the empty tomb story is also part of the pre-market passion source and therefore very early. The passion source used by Mark did not end in defeat and death with the burial story. Rather, it ends with the empty tomb account, which is grammatically one piece with the burial narrative. Secondly, the old tradition cited by Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth implies the fact of the empty tomb. For any first century Jew to say as this formula did that he was buried and that he was raised would imply that an empty grave was left behind. Moreover, the expression he was raised on the third day probably derives from the date of the women's visit to the empty tomb on the third day in Jewish reckoning after Jesus' crucifixion. The four-line tradition which Paul cites summarizes both the passion narrative in the Gospels as well as the early apostolic preaching in the book of Acts. And significantly, what corresponds in each to the third line of the formula uh, and that he was risen in both cases is the narrative and proclamation of the empty tomb. Thirdly, Mark's story of the empty tomb is simple and lacks signs of legendary embellishment. All one has to do to appreciate this point is to compare Mark's account to the accounts which are found in the later apocryphal Gospels. These are forgeries that arose during the centuries following the appearance of the New Testament. These do contain all sorts of wild, legendary accounts about the resurrection. For example, in the so-called Gospel of Peter, which is a forgery from the second half of the second century after Christ, the tomb 
is surrounded not only by a Roman guard, but also by all of the chief priests and the Pharisees, as well as a huge crowd of people from the surrounding countryside who have come to watch the tomb. Suddenly, during the night, a voice rings out from heaven, and the stone over the door of the tomb rolls back by itself. Then two men are seen descending out of heaven and entering into the tomb. Then three men, gigantic figures, come out of the tomb. The heads of two of the men reach to the clouds. The head of the third man overpasses the clouds. And then a cross comes out of the tomb. And a voice from heaven asks, Hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross answers, Yea. Now, these are how real legends look. They are colored with all sorts of theological and apologetical motifs. Motifs which are conspicuously lacking from the Markan account, which by comparison is stark in its simplicity. Number four, the fact that women's testimony was less trustworthy than that of men in first century Palestine counts in favor of the women's role in the discovery of the empty tomb. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, uh, illustrates the attitude toward the testimony of women in Jewish society when he says, due to the levity and the temerity of their sex, women should not be allowed to serve as legal witnesses in a court of law. The testimony of women was regarded as so untrustworthy that it wouldn't even be admitted uh, into a Jewish court, according to Josephus. So any later legendary account of the discovery of the empty tomb would certainly have made male disciples, like Peter and John, discovered the empty tomb. The fact that it is women whose testimony was regarded as worthless who are the chief witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb is best explained by the fact that they were the discoverers of the empty tomb and the gospel writers faithfully record what for them was an awkward and embarrassing fact. Number five, the earliest Jewish allegation that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body, which is found in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 15, shows that the body was, in fact, missing from the tomb. What was the earliest Jewish response to the disciples' proclamation, He is risen from the dead, that these men are full of new wine, that his corpse is still there in the tomb in the hillside? No, they responded, the disciples came and stole away his body. Now think about that. The disciples came and stole away his body. The earliest Jewish response to the proclamation of the resurrection was itself a feeble attempt to try to explain away why the body was missing. And thus we have evidence for the empty tomb, which is absolutely top war, because it comes not from the Christians, but from the very opponents of the early Christian movement. Now, I could go on, but I think that enough has been said to indicate why in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, and I quote, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number three, on multiple occasions, and under a variety of circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. This is a fact which is universally acknowledged today by New Testament scholars for at least the following three reasons. Number one, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances which is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, guarantees that such appearances occur. These included appearances to uh, Peter, or Cephas, as his Aramaic name is given, the 12 disciples, the 500 brethren, 
and James, Jesus' own younger brother. Secondly, the appearance traditions in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of these appearances. This is one of the most important earmarks of historicity, multiple early independent attestation. For example, the appearance to Peter is independently attested by Luke and Paul. The appearance to the Twelve is independently attested by Luke, John, and Paul. We also have independent witness to Galilean appearances in Mark, Matthew, and John, as well as independent traditions of appearances to the women in Matthew and John. Thirdly, certain appearances have earmarks of historicity. For example, we have very good evidence in the Gospels that neither James nor any of Jesus' younger brothers were believers in Jesus during his lifetime. There's no reason whatsoever that the early church would generate fictitious stories concerning the unbelief of Jesus' own family had they been faithful followers of Jesus all along. And so it's reasonably certain historically uh, that neither James nor his other brothers were followers of Jesus during his lifetime. But it is equally indisputable that James and his brothers did become active Christian believers following Jesus' death. James was considered to be an apostle in the early church, and he eventually rose to the position of sole leadership of the Jerusalem church. In fact, according to the first century historian Josephus, uh, whom I alluded to before, James was martyred for his faith in Christ in the AD 60s during a lapse in the civil government. Now, think about that. Most of us have brothers. What would it take to convince you that your brother is the Lord so that you would be willing to die for this belief? Can there be any doubt that the reason for this remarkable transformation in James is because in Paul's words, then he appeared to James. Even Gaut Ludemann, who is the leading German New Testament critic of the resurrection today, himself admits, and I quote, it may be taken as historically certain, and those are his words, not mine, as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four, the original disciples believed that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation the disciples faced following Jesus' death. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jewish Messianic beliefs had no idea of a Messiah who instead of triumphing over the enemies of Israel, would be shamefully executed by them as a common criminal. The Messiah was supposed to throw off Israel's enemies, and in this case, that meant Rome, and reestablish the throne of David in Jerusalem, to which Jew and Gentile alike would be subject, not to suffer defeat at the hands of the Gentiles and suffer the ignominious death of a common criminal. Secondly, according to Jewish law, Deuteronomy 21-23, Jesus' execution as a criminal showed him out to be a man literally under God's curse. You see, the catastrophe of the crucifixion for these early disciples was not simply that Jesus was dead, that their leader and friend was gone, but rather that according to Jewish law, the crucifixion showed, in effect, that the chief priests and the Jewish authorities had been right all along. That they had been following a heretic, a man literally accursed by God. Thirdly, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife 
precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection of the dead uh, at the end of the world. Confronted with Jesus' crucifixion, all the disciples could do was simply, at most, to preserve their master's tomb as a shrine where his bones could reside until that day when they and all the righteous dead of Israel would be reunited with him in the kingdom of God and raised by God to glory. Nevertheless, despite every predisposition to the contrary, the original disciples believed in and were willing to go to their deaths for their belief in the fact of Jesus' resurrection. Luke Johnson, who is a prominent New Testament critic from Emory University, muses some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. You need a launching pad to launch this missile. In summary then, there are four facts agreed upon by the majority of New Testament scholars today who have written on this subject and which any adequate historical hypothesis must account for. Jesus' burial by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb, the discovery of his empty tomb by his women followers, his post-mortem appearances to various individuals and groups, and the very origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. So the question is, what is the best explanation of these four facts? This is where the disagreement arises. Scholars are fairly united on the historicity of these facts. The disagreement comes with how you best explain them. Most scholars, I think, would probably simply remain agnostic about this question. Many of them will say that as historians, they cannot entertain a miraculous or supernatural hypothesis like the resurrection simply for methodological reasons. But the Christian can maintain that the hypothesis that best explains these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, the historian C.B. McCullough lists six tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation for a given body of historical facts. And I believe that the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all of these tests. Number one, it has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty, why the disciples saw post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and why the Christian faith came into being. Second, it has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was gone, why people repeatedly saw Jesus alive, despite his earlier public execution, and so forth. Three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims, the resurrection serves as a divine confirmation or vindication of those allegedly blasphemous claims for which he was crucified. Number four, it is not ad hoc, uh, that is to say contrived. It requires only one additional hypothesis, and that is that God exists. And that needs to be an additional hypothesis if you already believe that God exists. And I think that we do have sound philosophical arguments for the existence of God. Number five, it is in accord with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, doesn't in any way conflict with the belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. The Christian accepts that belief as wholeheartedly as he accepts the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead.
And finally, number six, it far outstrips any of its rival hypotheses in meeting criteria one through five. Down through history, various alternative explanations of these four facts have been offered. For example, the conspiracy hypothesis that, that the disciples stole the body of Jesus and lied about the resurrection appearances. The apparent death hypothesis that Jesus was taken down from the cross alive and somehow escaped from the tomb and presented himself to the disciples. The hallucination hypothesis that the disciples hallucinated post-mortem visions of Jesus and so forth. Such hypotheses, however, have been nearly universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. None of these naturalistic hypotheses succeeds in meeting the six criteria as well as does the resurrection hypothesis. Now, this puts the skeptical critic in a rather desperate situation. For example, a few years ago, I had a debate on the resurrection of Jesus at the University of California with a professor who had written his doctoral thesis on the evidence for the resurrection. He was thoroughly familiar with the evidence, and he could not deny the facts of the honorable burial, the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, or the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. And so his only recourse was to come up with some alternative explanation of these facts. And so he argued that Jesus of Nazareth must have had an unknown identical twin brother who was separated from him at birth, who grew up independently, no one knew about him, but who came back to Jerusalem just at the time of the crucifixion, stole his brother's body out of the tomb, and presented himself to the disciples who mistakenly thought that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, I'm not going to go into how I went about refuting this theory, but I think that the example is instructive because it shows to what desperate lengths skepticism must go in order to explain away the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, did you know that the evidence is so powerful that one of the leading Jewish theologians of today, the late Pinkus Lapid, who taught at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Jewish theologian, declared himself convinced on the basis of the evidence that the God of Israel raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Now, if this is right, it has profound implications. The significance of the resurrection of Jesus lies in the fact that it's not just any old person that has been raised from the dead, but it is Jesus of Nazareth whose crucifixion was instigated by the Jewish leadership because of his blasphemous claims to divine authority. If this man has been raised from the dead, then the God whom he allegedly blasphemed has publicly and unequivocally committed himself to him and vindicated those claims. The resurrection of Jesus is God's divine confirmation of Jesus' claims to have divine authority and to be the absolute revelation of God. Thus, in an age of religious pluralism and relativism, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus constitutes, I think, a solid rock on Christians on which Christians can take their stand on God's decisive self-revelation in Jesus.